Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Wachtel. I'm a rising third year at Stanford Law School, where I, oh, <laughs> where I serve with Rhett Millsaps as co-president of our ACS chapter. It is my pleasure to introduce our faculty advisor, Professor Pam Carlin. It would be impossible to convey the influence Professor Carlin has had on me and the countless other law students who have benefited from her teaching, writing, and advice. Professor Carlin stands as a role model for any progressive young lawyer who seeks to become a leader in this profession. With her well-known wit, passion, and commanding knowledge, she challenges and teaches us how to meet the demands of the essential legal battles of today and tomorrow. Professor Carlin received a BA, Master's, and JD from Yale. Following law school, she clerked for Judge Sofair, anyone, no? And in the Southern District of New York, and then for Justice Blackman for the 1985 to 1986 term. Her legal career began at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she worked for two years following her clerkships. She remains active with the NAACP and other prominent organizations seeking social justice through the law. In 1988, Professor Carlin embarked on a highly distinguished teaching career at the University of Virginia Law School, joining the faculty at Stanford 10 years later. She has received numerous awards for her extraordinary teaching abilities. At Stanford, she founded the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic, allowing students the remarkable opportunity to produce written work for submission to the Supreme Court. Our ACS chapter has been lucky to have her as its faculty advisor since its inception, and we are all lucky that she is a leading light of the growing national ACS movement. It is with great gratitude and respect that I introduce to you Professor Pam Carlin. Uh, thank you all so much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I want to assure you there's actually a typographical error in the schedule. If you look at the bottom of it, um, I'm not speaking from 11.15 a.m. to 11.45 p.m. Uh, so uh, this is not going to be a remake of the old Frank Capra classic, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, uh, with me in the role made famous by Jimmy Stewart. Uh, actually, here at ACS, we already have a Mr. Smith uh, who's a folk hero who's come to Washington, our chairman of the board, Paul Smith, uh, to whom I've looked up ever since I was in first grade, uh, and he was in fifth. Um, Judge Pat Walls, who moderated a wonderful panel yesterday morning, uh, on Friday morning, on the checks and balances, is the source of a famous aphorism uh, that she credits to her uh, late colleague Harold Leventhal about what it means to uh, cite legislative history. And the aphorism says, citing legislative history is a little bit like looking out over a crowd and picking out your friends. Uh, and this may explain why our founding father, Peter Rubin, calls this the American Constitution Society and not the American Society for Legislative History. Because when you look out over a room like this, it's hard to pick out your friends because everybody is your friend. And it's a really uh, great thing to be in a room where you realize you are not alone. Now, uh, we've heard a lot over the last couple of days about the troubles our country now faces. Uh, and the task of addressing them seems very daunting. Uh, but it's important to remember that ACS is only four years old. And I think we should take some real reassurance uh, from the words of Dr. Martin Luther King at the end of the Selma uh, to Montgomery uh, uh, march that led to the Voting Rights Act that we've heard so much about the last couple of days. Because here's what Dr. King said. I know you're asking how long will it take? I come to you to say that however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth pressed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long, because no lie can live forever. Not even lies about weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> How long? Not long, because you still reap what you sow. 
And politicians who declare war on immigrants are going to find when those people become citizens and when their children grow up that they will reap what they have sown. How long? Not long. Because the arm of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Our job here at ACS is to hang on to the end of that arm and bend it faster. The Federalist Society was started my first year in law school by people who were my classmates, and it has managed in a generation to move this country towards its vision, a cramped vision of what we should become. So that I hope by the time those of you here today who are first-year law students are my age, and I am not old, <laughs> we will see the nation move back to its deepest commitments. Now, I'm thinking about what I should say to you today. I was struck by a feeling that's been echoed in almost every presentation I've been to, and that is a hunger for the kind of leaders we've had in the past and the kind of inspiration we've had in the past. Now, when you come to Washington, as I did earlier this week, and I had some time to walk around the city before uh, the panels began, you're instantly struck by a physical manifestation of those present leaders, by the Lincoln and the Jefferson and the FDR memorials, and by the Washington Monument, a monument to a President George who didn't want to become king. Now, you notice I didn't mention Ronald Reagan National Airport in that list of monuments. But anyway, when you come here and you walk around and you see the monuments, you see a lot of classical architecture, you see a lot of marble. And so when you think about our democracy and you think about classical marble and architecture, you're led back to thinking about the first great democracy, the Athenian democracy. And perhaps because we're at war and perhaps because I spent time doing ancient history before I became a lawyer, I was reminded of Thucydides' account of Pericles' funeral oration during the Pel Peloponnesian War. Now, Pericles was a great leader, and he goes to the funerals of the people who were killed in the war. That's what a great leader does. A great leader goes to the funerals. He doesn't ban the media from showing the caskets coming back into the country so that people forget there's a war on. And what Pericles says towards the end of his oration is that to famous men, all the earth is a sepulcher, and their virtues shall be testified to not only by the inscription in stone at home, but by an unwritten record of the mind, which more than any monument will remain with people forever. Now, what Thucydides said then is right today. The greatness of Washington, the greatness of Lincoln, the greatness of Jefferson, the greatness of Franklin Roosevelt is not in those monuments, but in the messages that they gave to us. And I don't know how many of you at some point over the last couple of years have heard or read W.H. Uh, Auden's poem, September 1st, 1939. Anybody here look at this? You ought to go read it as soon as we come out of your day. Those of you who have blackberries out, you ought to thumb through right now. Uh, because this is a poem that speaks to us today, and one, it, it's a poem that describes what Auden calls a low, dishonest decade. It's a poem in which he talks about the unmentionable of odor of death that offends the September night. But it's also a poem that describes what he calls the windiest militant trash important people shout. And towards the end of it, he says, Exiled Thucydides knew all a speech can say about democracy, and what dictators do, the elderly rubbish they talk to an apathetic grave. And we need today to stand up to the messages of the elderly rubbish, the elderly militant rubbish that people talk. But there's one difference between our democracy and Thucydides that's pervaded the last couple of days and that's played a role in a number of the panels. And that's that unlike the Athenian constitution, ours is a written one. And so we should never forget that it begins, we the people, not they the Congress, or them over there, the Supreme Court, and certainly not I the President. Well, now that I've talked about... Well, now that I've made my textual argument, let's get down to serious business. Um, I believe in what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. 
We have to seize back the high ground on patriotism and on love of our country because we have more reason than they do to love America. The rich, pampered, prodigal, sanctimonious, incurious, white, straight sons of the powerful do pretty well everywhere in the world, and they always have. <laughs> but what about us? Snarky, bisexual Jewish women who want the freedom to say what we think, read what we want, and love whom we do. keep other people from having the great opportunities I've had here in the United States. I want other people to share them. I mean, I, it never occurred to me growing up that I would get to, first of all, that I get to speak at ACS. It never occurred to me there'd be an ACS. It also never even occurred to me that like, I could come to a speech and the former first lady would mention my name. And not as an example of something that should be despised and hated, <laughs> but as somebody who's trying to do some good in the world. So the thing that makes America great is we, the people, and we have to remind people that we are the people, not they, we. And so I'm inspired by Barbara Jordan, who was the first black person elected to Texas since from Texas to Congress since Reconstruction as a result of the Voting Rights Act. Now at the Watergate hearings, here's what she said, and it's something we need to take to heart. Earlier today, we heard the beginning of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. We the people. It's a very eloquent beginning. But when that document was completed on the 17th of September in 1787, I was not included in that we the people. I felt that for many years that George Washington and Alexander Hamilton just left me out by mistake. Yeah, right. Uh, but through that process of amendment, interpretation, and court decision, I have finally been included in We the People. Today, I am an inquisitor. A hyperbole would not be fictional and would not overstate the solemnness that I feel right now. My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. And I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. We need to feel that way too. We need to become inquisitors. We cannot sit by and watch today's attempts to diminish, to subvert, or to destroy the Constitution by government officials who think that they, like Richard Nixon, are the law rather than its servants. Louis XVI was wrong when he said, L'État, c'est moi. So too is Bush, le corps troisième, which means George the 43rd, for those of you who don't speak French. Now, Senator Clinton began our conference by talking about privacy, and in her speech, she mentioned Justice Louis Brandeis and how he, in some sense, with Samuel Warren, invented the concept of the legal right to privacy in an 1890 Law Review article. It's an inspiring example of the value of scholarship. Would that any of us ever writes anything half so important as that. It tells us scholarship can make a difference in the world, and that's reassuring for those of us who spend a lot of time doing it. But Justice Brandeis wasn't just a seminal thinker with regard to privacy. He was also a prophetic voice with regard to the importance of dissent. In 1919, Charlotte Whitney was convicted of criminal syndicalism basically belonging to an organization that advocated what was then called dictatorship of the proletariat. She challenged her imprisonment by arguing it was unconstitutional to punish her for her political views. The Supreme Court disagreed. Charlotte Whitney lost. But Justice Brandeis wrote a separate opinion in her case to explain the relationship between security and freedom, an opinion that lies at the cornerstone of our current doctrine of civil liberties. It's worth remembering what he said. Those who won our independence recognized the risk to which all human institutions are subject. But they knew that order cannot be secured merely through fear of punishment for its infraction. That it's hazardous to discourage hope, thought, and imagination. 
that fear breeds repression, that repression breeds hate, that hate menaces stable government, that the path of safety lies in the opportunity to discuss freely supposed grievances and proposed remedies, and that the fitting remedies for evil counsel is good ones. Believing in the power of reason as applied through public discussion, they eschewed silence coerced by law. And he reminded us in a sentence that I find the most chilling one almost in all of U.S. reports, a sentence that parallels in some ways the sentence Walter Dellinger quoted last night, then the war came. The sentence, men feared witches and burned women. Men feared witches and burned women. Now what does Justice Brandeis mean by that? Perhaps that our fears can lead us to see dangers that don't exist and to inflict terrible injuries that can't be righted on real people. Of course, September 11th reminds us of some very real threats. But it's important to distinguish among the dangers that exist, the dangers that can be controlled, and the dangers that don't exist or that can't be controlled or the price of which is too high to pay. In his first inaugural address, President Roosevelt asserted his belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror that paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Now, that's not exactly true. We actually do have other things to fear. Terrorism, racism, sexism, homophobia, Dick Cheney, But fear that paralyzes us or throws us into reflexive spasms makes everything worse. And we've always been lucky in America up till now that in our times of greatest crisis, we have had leaders who could appeal to our optimism as a people, not to leaders who want to exploit our fears. It used to be that courageous political leaders of both parties understood this point. And that's why I'm running for governor of Massachusetts as a Republican. Um, now, you, you know, I've quoted the icons so far of the American Constitution Society. I have Dr. Martin Luther King, Barbara Jordan, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But now I want to quote somebody else to you, somebody who was extremely wise about this issue, President Eisenhower. A Republican who is a real soldier, not somebody who just flies in for a photo op on the deck of an aircraft carrier. And what he thought about something that was new in his time, the conjunction of an immense military establishment and large arms industry. We recognize, he said, and this is what he said as he left office, this was the president when I was born. We recognize, he said, the imperative need for this development. Yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. It's Eisenhower who invented the idea that we face danger from the military-industrial complex. Because, he said, the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can, propel the, can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machines of our defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Remember Eisenhower and what he said, as well as what our own personal heroes have said. But this is not just a time for danger. It's one of opportunity as well. In our history, wartime has been the occasion for some of our greatest, our greatest efforts to realize our aspirations. Now, the Civil War certainly hastened the day of emancipation, and we owe to it the 14th and 15th Amendments, which have done more than anything else to bring real democracy to the Constitution. World War I furthered the efforts of women's suffrage. 
World War II was the occasion for the double V victory, for victory over fascism abroad and over racism at home. But let me focus on a less obvious point for a moment. The Civil War didn't only produce emancipation and reconstruction. It also brought Abraham's Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's promise in his second inaugural address, in a part that Walter didn't read last night that I'd like to read to you tonight, his promise to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and for his orphan, which marks the beginning of the time that we had an idea that government has a responsibility to us, that the social contract is not just something where we give to them, but something where they pay back to us. And it's a recognition that social security is a critical element of national security. We should not forget that today. And I was particularly struck by this because, you know, these are the lines that are over the uh, lintel at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I was particularly struck by this because as I was here at the conference, I call home to see how everything's going on. And my partner, who served for four years in the U.S. Army, which is more than we can say for the people who are now sending our soldiers into harm's way, told me, oh, I got a letter today telling me that all of my personal information was stolen. Right? This is what Hillary Clinton was talking about when she first came here, right? which is we owe more to our veterans than to send them into harm's way and ignore them when they come home. And we owe more to the people in this country who need social security. They need social security as well as national security. Now, at the height of World War II, May 21, 1944, Judge Learned Hand, nominated to the federal district court by reactionary Republican William Howard Taft and to the Second Circuit by reactionary Republican Calvin Coolidge, because in those days even conservatives recognized excellence. Judge Learned Hand spoke at a naturalization ceremony in New York at which 150,000 immigrants were being naturalized. And before the new citizens said the Pledge of Allegiance, he made a few remarks that we should remember today when we think about war and immigration and freedom. Here's what he said. We've gathered together here to affirm a faith, a faith in a common purpose, a common conviction, a common devotion. Some of us have chosen America as the land of our adoption. The rest of us have come from those who did the same. For this reason, we have some right to consider ourselves a picked a picked group, a group of those who had the courage to break from the past and brave the dangers and loneliness of a strange land. What was the object that nerved us or those who went before us to this choice? We sought liberty, freedom from oppression, freedom from want, freedom to be ourselves. This we then sought. This we now believe that we are by way of winning. What do we mean when we say that, first of all, we seek liberty? I often wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts. These are false hopes. Believe me, these are false hopes. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women when it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. What then is the spirit of liberty? I cannot define it. I can only tell you my own faith. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure it is right. The spirit of liberty is the spirit that weighs the interests of others alongside its own without bias. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which seeks to understand the mind of other men and women. The spirit of liberty remembers that not even a sparrow falls to earth unheeded. The spirit of the liberty is the spirit of him who near 2,000 years ago taught mankind the lesson it has never learned but never quite forgotten, that there may be a kingdom where the least shall be heard and considered side by side with the greatest. Now, for the most part, I agree with Judge Hand 
although, of course, he and I have different faiths. But each of those faiths, and I would expect the faiths, whether religious or secular, of everyone in this room believes that the least should be heard and considered side by side with the greatest. But I actually have two disagreements with Judge Hand. The first is I think liberty does need the law, the Constitution, and the courts. That is where we give real voice to the spirit of liberty we have. And the second way I disagree with Judge Hand is, although I think he's probably right that the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it's right, there are some things I am sure about. It is wrong to torture prisoners. It is wrong to execute the innocent. It is wrong to demonize immigrants or gay men and lesbians. It's wrong to force women to carry unwanted pregnancies to term. It's wrong to let children go to bed hungry. And it's wrong to leave our fellow citizens clinging to the roofs of their house in a flood. I'm certain about that. But we can't just be against things. We have to say what we're for. And here, the message I take away from the convention this week is that we in ACS have thick and not thin conceptions of what democracy and the rule of law are about. You may have noticed that on the last panel. Most of the last panel was not about voting. It was not about periodic elections. It was not about what you find in the US code. It was about what the preconditions for democracy and the rule of law really are. We need a democracy, of course, in which all citizens have the right to vote, have access to the polls, and are sure that their votes are actually counted. And we need a democracy in which politics is organized in a way that maximizes citizens' individual ability to actually elect leaders who are responsive to their needs. But we also need a democracy in which individuals have the material resources necessary to participate effectively and to have their voices heard. We need a democracy in which citizens receive the kind of education that allows them to exercise their rights intelligently. And we need a rule of law that's more than just a law of rules. We need laws that are just and not just laws that satisfy the presentment clause. So here are some concrete things that I think you can do. And they're not concrete in the sense of saying, here is a very precise small law that we ought to go out and persuade our legislators to do, to enact. We've talked about those laws. We've talked about them on the local level, on the state level, and on the national level. And obviously, we can go back as citizens to do that. But I wanted to give you some things you actually can do yourself, regardless of what the legislature looks like and regardless of what the courts look like. So here are some concrete things. First of all, this fall, be a poll watcher or be an election official. Get in there on the ground level and see how democracy works and make sure that when citizens cast their ballots, they're not intimidated and they're not confused about what their rights are. Second. When you see stories in your local papers, or for those of you who are at law school, have your parents send you the things from the small town papers where we all grew up, right? Write letters to the editor and get them published that get our point of view out there. Write op-eds, not just for the New York Times, but for the local paper that get our point of view out there. Uh, and you'll be amazed at how little things you might say can have big consequences. People will start to think about them. Third, if you have the time, do something more th about this thicker conception of democracy. Be a literacy tutor or an after-school tutor for kids who need help getting educated. Fourth, for all of us, we need to do pro bono work, or if you're in law school, you need to do clinical work in which you actually provide for other people's unmet need legal needs. Fifth, and you heard a little bit about this on the last panel, you know, our tax system is a disgrace. We don't tax ourselves enough, and therefore we don't do enough with government funds. So here's one thing I think you ought to do. Tax yourself. 
figure out what you think the government ought to be taxing you, put that money aside and give it to organizations that do what the government ought to be doing. Right? If you think taxes should be higher, you're not going to get the federal government to do that now. And if you're planning on dying anytime soon and you're rich enough, pay the estate tax by leaving the money to people who can use it. Not that I'm hoping any of you are in that. But, well, I hope all of you will be rich enough one day that you will be taxed heavily under the estate tax that we will then have. In the meantime, if you want change, we've heard a lot of talk about change. Here's something I've done that I actually think surprisingly makes a little bit of a difference. Let's talk about a different kind of change. Every night when you go home, empty out your pockets and put all the change into a jar. And once a month or once a year, count what's in the jar and give it to charity. I know this sounds kind of stupid, but you would be amazed how much money. I mean, you could also save all the dust bunnies and knit a sweater for somebody. But sir, and you'll find it. If you go under the bed every every night, clean out the dust bunnies. Soon you'll have enough to 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 to, to clothe somebody. Um, but in the meantime, seriously, save that money. I mean, and don't like take it in like a huge thing. Of course, you go to the bank, you put it in there, and or, or you use it for parking. But keep count of that money. Finally, read read some history. And I wanted to give you a couple of books to read that I think would be helpful. One of them, which goes to points that Alan Jenkins was making in his talk earlier today, is Ira Katz Nelson's book, When Affirmative Action Was White. Because it talks about what the New Deal gave to so many Americans, things like Social Security and ultimately the GI Bill, federally subsidized mortgages, uh, roads that could lead them to le live out in the suburbs, but it explains who was left out of that. That Social Security originally did not pay farm workers, did not pay domestic workers. Farm workers and domestic workers didn't have the right to organize. The GI Bill didn't enable African American soldiers who came back here to go to institutions of higher education that refused to admit them. So it's important to understand that a lot of the inequality we have today is not the product of slavery, although there is still a lot of that. It's the product even of the good things that we did. And it's important to understand that and read about it. Read Jonathan Alter's book about the first hundred days of the Roosevelt administration so that you can see what imagination and courage can do. Read John Lewis's book, Walking with the Wind, so that you can get a sense of the truly great leaders we've had who began their great leadership even as students doing small things. Read the Federalist Papers so that we can reclaim them from the Federalist Society. Read Spencer Overton's book. <laughs> and if you have time left over or if you have a young child, may I recommend the book that my partner wrote, The Tequila Worm by Viola Canales. It's the heartwarming story, autobiographical, of a young girl who grew up in the barrio on the Mexican-American uh, border. She likes to say her family never crossed this border. The border crossed them. They've been living in the country for 200 years. But when she went to first grade, she didn't speak a word of English. And there was no bilingual education. But it's the story of growing up there and the values of family that are universal. And then she won a scholarship to go to a fancy boarding school. So for those of us who've spent our lives in fancy places, it will speak to us as well. I promised her I'd mention it. <laughs> Next week, of course, we are going to New Orleans, she and I, because the American Library Association is having its meeting there. And it's worth remembering New Orleans. And you might want to read The Great Flood which is the book about the last flood that came down the Mississippi River and how our government failed us then so that you'll understand uh, what's happening today. Now, I've given you a bunch of things you can go and do that are actually pretty concrete and that I think will make a difference. This is all a very large task, but we're up to it. To paraphrase my friend John Harrison, who was also here uh, on Friday for the Checks and Balances uh, panel, People who were too gutless to come to America and too gutless to build their lives here are not our ancestors. 
And so let me end with a call to arms, but a call to a different kind of arms than this administration has given us. It comes from my favorite poem, which was one of Robert F. Kennedy's favorite poems as well, Alfred Tennyson's Ulysses. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be that we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Good luck on your trips. Travel safely. See you here next year. Thank you.